So thank you, TEDx St. Louis, for choosing me to present today. It's a huge honor, and I hope I can do my time justice. Um, today, my talk is called Genes, Drugs, and Breast Cancer. So metastatic breast cancer, the sad facts. So globally, deaths from breast cancer are set to exceed half a million cases a year. Deaths from breast cancer occur all over the world, but is now particularly striking middle-income countries as they industrialize. The good news is that early treatment, when clinically evident disease is restricted to the breast, improves survival. But when the breast cancer cells spread around the body and have uh, and obviously growing in distant organs, cure is not possible. But I've dedicated my life to bringing a cure to those women. Curiously, only 5% of non-pharma breast cancer funding is actually focused on the treatment of advanced disease. Now, last year, a huge phone book called the Cancer Genome Atlas for Breast arrived on breast cancer researchers' desk with a big thud. So what was achieved in this enormous effort of over 200 scientists funded by the National Cancer Institute led by Charles Peru, a very good friend of mine, was to try and decode the genomes of hundreds and hundreds of breast cancers. And now our challenge is to take this phone book and annotate it. One approach that we've taken here in St. Louis of annotating breast cancer genomes is to take patients who have been treated in rather precise ways and link the success and failure of those therapies to the genomic information. So you can see in the title of this paper, aromatase inhibition. What aromatase inhibition is, is a pill that you take to reduce the amount of estrogen in your body. And that's important because the kind of breast cancer that we were treating here is fueled by estrogen. So when you reduce the estrogen labels in the woman's body, miraculous things happen. And the tum tumors go away, but sometimes they don't. And so understanding why the treatment is successful sometimes and unsuccessful in other women is obviously critical to progress. Again, this investigation involved over 50 authors, and I just shout out my friends leading here and Elaine Mardis, who were key to the success of the program. Of course, I could give hours of talk about actually what we discovered, but I like this particular diagram it was developed by that gentleman there, Ted Goldstein. Ted Goldstein wrote the software for your iPhone, but he got bored with that and decided he wanted to go into medical bioinformatics instead. And he came up with that rather nice, nice analysis, which we called the wrist stick. At the top there, the red are patients doing poorly, and at the bottom, blue, patients doing well. And we were able to map a variety of genes, addresses, if you like, in that genomic phone book, uh, linking those genes to, uh, um, uh, to uh, uh, events that were occurring to pa pa patients, like treatment failure or treatment success. And each one of those genes are providing therapeutic opportunities for the poor outcome patients. So the top line summary for all this so far is that we have lots and lots of new altered genes that are linked to hormone receptor positive breast cancer. But there's another form of breast cancer that's not fueled by estrogen. And when we look at those genomes, it's incredibly complex. The genomes are shattered, and we still don't really understand what's going on there. One of the things that got me rather excited when I looked at these estrogen-fueled breast cancers is there was a lot of a links uh, to genes also implicated in leukemia, which might explain this unpleasant ability of these cells to travel around the body. But overall, we're on the track of at least five different subtypes of breast cancer with different mutation patterns and designing therapies for those individual groups of patients. So one example of a recent discovery uh, was this gene HER2. Now HER2 is absolutely critical for the treatment of breast cancer because some breast cancers make too much of this HER2 protein and we attack it using an antibody which does miraculous things to improve breast cancer outcomes. But many breast cancers don't make too much of this protein. And we assumed that those, gene, those breast cancers, HER2 had nothing to do 
with how they grew. But it turns out, as a result of all this genomic analysis, we actually discovered there was another way to switch the HER2 on. Instead of taking too, making too much of the protein, the protein got recoded by these mutations that occur in cancer cells. And you can see in this nice slide how these mutations cluster on this lollipop diagram, uh, where the, the mutations aren't random through the gene, but focusing on a critical part of the gene called the kinase domain, turning that gene on in such a way that it can't be switched off by the cell. And that makes the cancer grow. And the great thing is there's a drug that works for these patients that's currently in clinical testing. And this work uh, was, was uh, done in collaboration with Ron Bose and Shyam Kurfi there, all at Wash U. So we've looked through the genomes, and we're looking for more and more and more therapeutic opportunities. This is kind of a list of opportunities that we've yet to work on. There are so many opportunities that we're sort of overwhelmed. So we have this problem of resolving complexity, a bit like when you look at the Hubble telescope and you see all those galaxies and you see all those black holes. I guess don't see the black holes, but you see the effects of the black holes. But a big difference between cancer biology and biological science in general and astrophysics is that we can actually do experiments. We can actually perturb systems and try and work out how it works. So a big problem that we have in breast cancer is what model should we use to resolve that complexity to understand that biology? And this is where another important advance has developed over the last five years. So on the left of this slide, you'll see there's something called cell lines. Cell lines is how we've been doing cancer research for the last 40 years. You persuade a cancer cell to grow on a plastic dish bathed in nutrients. And that is a very easy and simple and cheap system to cut, study cancer. But are you really studying cancer? Or is it such an artificial system that it doesn't really give you the right answers? The other problem is with these cell lines, they're only models of breast cancer in a general sense. They're not a model for breast cancer for, of an individual patient's breast cancer and an individual problem a patient faces. The opposite is something called PDX, patient-derived xenografts. So in a patient-derived xenograft, I have a patient in my clinic, Mrs. Jones, and I take her tumor with a biopsy, and I persuade that tumor to grow in a special mouse that has no immune system. So it will take a graft of those tumor cells. And they grow beautifully in that setting, and they even reproduce the disease you can see there on the right, which is the mouse's liver, unfortunately, um, in, in, uh, full of tumor cells, uh, just like the patient, unfortunately. Her liver also became full of tumor cells. So we really favor this PDX approach as models for individualized treatments for cancer, breast cancer in particular. So we're building a PDX bank. It looks like you go to clinic, you see your patients, and then you reproduce clinic in your laboratory. Every single patient you can possibly get, you get a model in the lab to see if you can work out why that patient's not doing well. And here, uh, my friends uh, Shun Li and Dong Shen are working hard on this PDX bank. The extraordinary thing about these PDX models is if you do deep genomic analysis, almost every change that you detect in the human tumor, growing in the human, is reproduced in the mouse. Not only do we see all the mutations in the mouse faithfully replicated, but we also find the frequency with which those mutations are occurring in the tumor which is an extraordinary thought because we seem to be looking at an equilibrium of mutational changes that, that is, despite the fact you crossed a species barrier and you've gone into a mouse, you can still see that hierarchy of mutations. So these models are really good. So let's see how we can use these models to actually work out why it was a patient did poorly. So case one is a 57-year-old uh, grandmother and at diagnosis, unfortunately, the cancer had already spread around her body. She treated with one of those estrogen-lowering drugs called letrozole for nine months. 
and then the disease grew. She then got a second estrogen-lowering drug, exemestane, which worked for an even shorter period of time. Another drug, which attacks the estrogen receptor in a different way, didn't work at all, and then we got the sample. And after some chemotherapy, unfortunately, she died. So how can I work out why it was that patient did so poorly? So this PDX model in the, directly from that patient growing in the mouse was completely resistant to estrogen. It didn't require estrogen to fuel its growth at all, which is weird because it had the estrogen receptor, but somehow the estrogen receptor wasn't functioning. And over on the right, you can see that that fulvestrant drug I gave her that didn't work in the patient also doesn't work in the mouse model. And when we did the genomics here, as we study these patterns, these genomic patterns, these are called circus plots, and all those green lines connecting in the middle of the circle are weird chromosomal connections. But one of them, marked with the red arrow, was a very interesting connection between two chromosomes that created a fusion gene that does not happen in any normal cell actually connected the estrogen receptor to another gene completely on another chromosome. And what that created was a molecule that would drive the tumor growth, but it didn't need estrogen anymore to stimulate it. In another example, a 36-year-old mother who was diagnosed with stage 3 disease, rapidly progressed uh, despite uh, various therapies, including tamoxifen, and then she received various drugs to slow the growth after it had metastasized, but eventually became resistant to all those drugs. We made a model from her, and again, this model, completely resistant to those anti-hormone agents, and fascinatingly, on the right, again, the lollipop, her tumor had mutated the estrogen receptor, and it's the, actually the blue mutation over on the right there, Y537S. That single amino acid change allows the estrogen receptor to function, activate, drive tumor growth without estrogen. Now, the fascinating thing about that is I can make a drug that hits the mutant receptor but does not touch the normal receptor. So now this is the genesis for a new type of drug discovery, which would be very specific for the treatment of that particular patient and other patients like her who had evolved that particular mutation. And in fact, you can see all those red spots underneath the blue spot, the Y537 on the right, are other patients with the same mutation. So this is not a one-off. This is recurrent mutations that now can be targeted with a brand new drug development program. Fabulous. Because if you understand something, you can fix it. What I'm trying to do here, then, is close the loop. We've got all this genomic information. Now we have to pharmacologically annotate all that information and turn it into drugs that we can give individual patients. Many of my patients say, make a model out of my cancer. Work out how to treat my cancer in that mouse, and then bring that cure to me. Well, actually, that's very hard to do because uh, this whole process uh, to fix one particular breast cancer can take years. But I think with these personalized models for breast cancer, we can learn the rules. We can even conduct complete clinical trials in mice before we go to humans so that we really take, when we do clinical trials research in humans, we really take just our very best ideas to those human, those, those human subjects, um, uh, as opposed to what we do now, which is sort of try different drugs, but not in a particularly directed way. So this work involves huge teams of people. Everyone has to keep their ego in their pocket. Everyone has to get along, and everyone has to keep an eye on the uh, goal, which is a cure uh, for breast cancer. And uh, I won't shout out all individual names here, but I will shout out the various funding agencies uh, that uh, are dedicated to a, to a world without breast cancer. The Breast Cancer Research Foundation, the National Cancer Institute, the Seitman Cancer Center, uh, Brown Shoe here in St. Louis, the Susan G. Komen for the Cure, 
Uh, and also, a final shout out for a new uh, charity here in St. Louis, Teresa Harpel Foundation for Metastatic Breast Cancer. These guys get it because they understand studying patients with metastatic breast cancer, the most needy patients, the patients who really need a treat better treatment today, uh, they're changing the odds uh, and bringing uh, much needed research funding to this area. So thank you very much to them too. <laughs>